<clears throat> Hi, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Newsmakers TV on the air since 2014 with Santa Barbara local news analysis and commentary. I'm Jerry Roberts. It is Friday, January 12th, 2024, just 51 days until California's March 5th primary and fewer than 300 days until the November presidential election. Uh, which officially kicks off Monday with, you heard it first, a huge win for Donald Trump and the Iowa caucuses. Uh, look at this morning's Real Clear Politics polling average and betting odds shows Trump leading Joe Biden by a point nationally and with a 37.5% chance of becoming the next president compared to Biden at 28.8. So get busy on those dual citizenship applications. All right, I want to welcome in at least part of this week's all-star panel of top local journalists, Josh Molina, Newshawk political writer, journalism educator, and the Pat McAfee of Santa Barbara podcasters, and making his long-awaited first appearance on Newsmakers TV, James Fenkner, global investor, government watchdog, and most recently, publisher of the newly launched uh, conservative online organ, SB Current. James, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me here. Thank you. So, so te tell us what is the uh, what is SB Current and and uh, how long has it been going and why now? Okay. Well, we uh, started uh, Santa Barbara Current, which if you want to find it, it's sbcurrent.com, and uh, started it. I think we launched November fifteenth um, uh, of last year, and. Uh, uh, we've been uh, just to let you know we've been uh, we've been carbon neutral uh, since our launch. Uh, we are only online, <laughs> uh, and uh, um, the uh, but our have editor you been chief, woke, um, James? Have you been woke? <laughs> uh, well, no. We we are probably your uh, one stop shop for non woke woke um, analysis and opinion. Um, so um, I'm we sorry uh, I interrupted you. Uh, yeah. So who's yeah, no, no, that's fine. Um, so uh, uh, Jim Buckley, who's the former uh, editor in chief of the Montecito Journal, is uh, our he's he's come on as our editor in chief, and um, we have a number of the uh, former uh, opinion writers uh, from the paper formerly known as the News Press, um, including Bonnie Donovan. Um, we have uh, Andy Caldwell, um, uh, 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 Brett uh, Zepke, um, uh, and as, as well as Robert Erringer. Um, and so we, we've kind of set this up as a way for, for people to continue to write. There's a lot of, I mean, uh, you know, um, a lot of sadness that uh, people didn't have a way to, to get their message out to, to share their uh, opinions. And so that's really what, what uh, prompted us to put this together. Yeah. And but it is, you know, very decidedly uh, um, a, a conservative, uh, a collection of conservative uh, views. You know, was that something that you felt is just, uh, you know, there's just really a hole in the market for, I guess. And let me welcome in Kelly Fozzi, who joins us. She's the environment, education and general assignment uh, writer for Santa Barbara Independent. Kelly, thanks for coming in. Uh, we're talking with James Fechner about uh, Santa Barbara Current, no S, right? Current. Um, That's right. So, yeah. So the, in terms of the conservative perspective on it, uh, you felt that that's something that really wasn't being represented in the market. Um, well, um, I don't think we looked at it from a market point of view. This isn't a, it's, you know, just the, the opportunity for people to tell their stories and um you know, there were, uh, there was a lot of uh, frustration that, you know, for example, Bonnie Donovan, who wrote this uh, really great article, uh, Did You Know? I don't know if you if you guys had, had read it in the weekly article and uh, really kind of dug into what's going on in, in at, at the city. And, you know, as uh, as uh, kind of we touched upon in and in, in uh, Josh Molina's class, you know, what's the purpose of the press? It's to it's to speak truth to power. And, um, you know, giving people a platform to do that um, is really what just that's just what this is about. 
Yeah. And we should point out that James uh, did uh, take uh, Josh's what, uh, I'm not sure which course it was, but uh, Josh, are you at liberty to tell me, uh, tell us what, what, what grade James got? <laughs> well, I got to tell you, um, it was Journalism 101 and James Fankner was, you know, amazing, just so good at everything he did. And I, what I learned in the class, I don't know what he learned, but what I learned was he's a really good writer and uh, he, you know, he did a really good in-depth feature and uh, it was good because I guess James is conservative and I guess I have a reputation for being maybe uh, not conservative, but maybe more moderate, liberal, and we learn from each other. And I, I, I thought it was a great a great class um, all around. I think he learned and I learned. Uh, let me ask you a question, uh, James, um, in terms of, you know, you went from the news press, which had like no online digital presence, really, right? It was sort of stuck uh, in time. And now you're doing this, like this new, what is it a newsletter? I mean, can you talk about Upstate, how yeah. people access uh, this content? And are you kind of doing something here that's, revolutionary new who else is doing it um it seems kind of cool this this format that you're working with yeah i think the um so we're we're hosting the site on this on this entity called substack and you could type in substack.com and and it's really it's set up for writers um it's uh um hosted a number of writers there's one uh, named barry weiss that you may have heard of uh from formerly of the new york times that that came onto Substack. Uh, Matt Taibbi, formerly of Rolling Stone, came to Substack. It was kind of a place where you were able to speak freely, right? You were able, you didn't have to go through the traditional um, types of, uh, uh, you know, uh, editing um, and oversight. So it was kind of a writer's, it's a, it's a writer's uh, platform. And, um, you know, it's very easy to set up. I would encourage everyone who wants to write uh, to set up a Substack, um, and uh, um, it, it allows you to have um, to, to post your things. It's it's it works best if you have some type of graphic to it, but you can also host podcasts on it, and um, you know is just the easiest way to launch. It would be nice to replicate. I mean, the, you know, there's a couple of the papers in town have amazing websites, um, but. You know, for an individual to do that would be a—it's quite a climb technologically and financially to rebuild it. So this is kind of an open. It's a very easy system. Wow. For anything to start. All right, we're we're gonna turn to the uh, school board in a second, which I before we leave um, SP Current, I, I thought the piece that you published by our old friend Christy Lozano about the number of settlements. Uh, at Santa Barbara Unified uh, for teachers who had uh, either sexually abused or or done something that that's really been the strongest piece. Wow, well, I, I you know putting that all together was really something. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I think, um, and I should mention as well that in kind of the core team, we've got four members. I know they, the Indy was very kind to write a story about our law. Talked about myself and. Jim Buckley, uh, but also Bonnie Donovan and Christy Lozano are are part of this of this team, um, and uh, we're looking at that, you know, because I think the it's a it's a hugely important issue uh, for the schools, um, and and it, I think we need, need to break it up into bits because this is just kind of a listing of what what actually is what the settlement the known settlements that we have, because there's a lot of cases where these things get settled, you know. Um, behind closed doors and you don't really know what happened. Um, in this particular story, you know, there's the, the big uh, settlement of $25 million uh, for uh, uh, Justin, uh, what is his name? Justin Sell was a, was a teacher of uh, Dos Pueblos. And um, what's interesting about this story, and we're kind of still trying to figure out how to, how to frame it, um, is that uh, in the court documents, the, you know, the, the court said that the district is 80% responsible for this settlement, right? Um, but if you look, you know, um, at the at that time, you know, looking at who was in the district, who was the principal and vice principal of DP at that time, you realize that, uh, you know, they did pretty well out of the school district. Um, there hasn't been any 
there's not like a clawback um, that you'd have in a corporate world where if you had some malfeasance, they could come and claw back your bonus or your pay. Um, and, uh, you know, something I think that, that has a lot of legs It's something we, we really as a community need to look at. And I think it, you know, would help explain why our schools um, aren't really uh, performing the way most people want them to perform. Look, yeah. Jerry, let me, let me, I just want to, I know we want to move on. There's one quick question for James is, you know, one of the things about a site like yours that gives me pause, I mean, I, 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 I love the idea, but as a journalist is, do, you know, did Christy, does Bonnie, do, whoever's writing, do you, do you seek out the other side? And I know that there's feelings that conservatives don't think a lot of journalists do, and there's a perspective, but you know, the definition of a journalist is you do try to reach everybody who has a, a perspective, a stakeholder to offer balance. And I mean, is that your goal or is it really just to have a position and then offer kind of an analysis? Because I know if I'm reading a story on that site, I might wonder, are they doing everything they can to give the school district uh, a voice in the story? So can you help me kind of understand what the, the editorial process is for that? Says the guy who has consistently uh, stomped uh, Superintendent Hildemann in auto. Uh, I didn't ask you, Jerry. I asked you. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I know. I like Jerry's answer. Um, yeah, look, uh, Josh, we, I mean, we kind of touched upon this a little bit in your class as well. You know, the um, and I think there's a couple different ways to look. You, you know, either the journalist can be a pure form and, uh, you know, unbiasedness to be able to do that. That's a hard uh, that's a hard line to walk. I think I, I think from the from the school's point of view, and look, the school has its own PR manager, right? I, I think they have a couple. The district has a PR. The school has a PR. I'm not really worried about the school um, getting their point across. Um, I think the biggest challenge in a small town like ours, where the, where personal relationships really matter, is to be able to call things out. And so, um, in terms of our process, just to be very clear, um, Jim Buckley is our editor in chief. Uh, he looks he looks at all the stories and you know he's been in this business for 20 years he's very very you know highly respected um but we're not producing per se, per se news we're doing analysis what that news means and opinion and i think you know um on that side we want to make sure of course we're not disparaging somebody but we're not there to tell all sides of the story i think we're telling it we want to tell the side of the story that's not told and specifically this issue of Truth to power that you know the school district is very very powerful. They have a huge budget. They're extremely influential, and um, we when there's issues that that should be disclosed that perhaps aren't, you know, we want to help do that. I mean, for example, the school district you know doesn't have even its financials online. So I think there's a lot of um, you know if we're this is it's a hugely important entity and uh, it needs some type of oversight to it. I, yeah. I hope I answered your question. Oh, it's great. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about the school district. Callie, um, a bunch of news actually this week. Uh, first of all, there's a new member of Virginia Alvarez rather abruptly resigned uh, late last year with a, what a, a little more than a year left on her term. Uh, so the school board set out what 14 people applied or something. Talk about that and who ended up as the fifth member. Um, yeah, so Sunita Veal was elected as, or yeah, appointed as the um, fifth member of Virginia's replacement um, after they did interviewing for like two days. And yeah, 14 applicants, a lot of familiar names in there. Um, familiar did you sit names. through all that, Kelly? Did you have to sit through and listen to all that? I didn't know. <laughs> um like I watched it on Zoom, to be honest. And um, yeah, but um, yeah, so Sunita Beal, she's a parent of a student at Santa Barbara High School. She's the son who graduated from Dos Pueblos. Uh, she's a physician at UCSB. She seems more than qualified. So. Very serious person, yeah. And that was something of a surprise, I think. Um, the, you know, the first rule of politics is that conventional wisdom is always wrong. And the conventional wisdom was that Kate Parker, who's a former school board member, former uh, uh, city college board member, was going to get it. But uh, she only ended up with, what, two votes or something, huh? 
Yeah, it was kind of split down the middle. Um, so she got two votes and Beal got two votes. Um, yeah, I was kind of surprised about that too. So who switched their vote to 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 give it to Sunita? I think it was Banning and Munoz, right, Josh? Yeah, Banning and and Rose Bill Banning and Rose Munoz uh, selected Kate Parker, and then uh, Gabe Escobedo and Wendy Sims Moten were in support of Sunita Bill, Doctor Bill, and so they talked about it, and then uh, Bill Banning said, you know. I'm going to defer to the vice chair and the chair. And, you know, I feel strongly about Dr. Beal too. So sure, I'll, I'll, I'll go for her. And then Rose followed suit. Yeah, there was a lot going on behind the scenes. And, and I, I heard a bunch of, you know, sort of gossip and, and uh, other uh, incidents about it. And, and Hilda really wanted somebody who would go along with her. And I think, you know, she, she felt comfortable with Kate. I think Kate was on, May have been part of the search committee that that hired Hilda, um, and uh, uh, she certainly didn't want the other Kate, Kate Ford, uh, who also, uh, you know, I think was willing to come back. But uh, I think this is a good move. James, did you have any uh, a sense of uh, the new member or if it's going to change the school board? I know uh, you've been unhappy with the whole direction over there. Well, you know, I, I don't know. Dr. Beale, but she sounds, you know, look, she sounds like a charming, uh, competent person, but uh, so too was uh, Virginia Alvarez. You know, she was, uh, she was actually a very good, um, very thoughtful person. But, you know, um, if I can kind of pitch our side a little bit, um, one of the most popular articles we have in our so far is about courage. And it's not just to have competency, uh, but it, to have courage. And that means to kind of push back against things. And, you know, I think that's what needs to happen at the school board. Um, if we're going to have the changes that people want, the, the good educational outcomes that a lot of people want. Yeah. Well, Callie, I mean, Dr. Beal, as I, I mean, I seem to recall her testifying on a number of things. She's done a lot of public commenting and I think been critical of the administration at some points, but here I should know this and I don't. Can, who does she now? Is she going to run again in the fall? Because there's elections for several school board members, and I think you mentioned uh, at the bottom of your piece who's up. And can you can you recap that? Yeah. So um, she did say that she wanted to run for uh, like official seat on the board when yeah come fall elections, um, and. Banning seat is up as well as Sims Moten seat is up. And Virginia Alvarez, when she was elected, she was elected to an at-large position. So it didn't matter what trustee area she was in. Uh, but technically her seat is trustee area five. And Sunita Beal resides in trustee area two. But since she's elected to this at-large position, it's okay. She doesn't she can live anywhere basically. But, and then, but that's just to finish Virginia's term. Is but that's it, exactly. So that's just to finish Virginia's term. And then so when the seats are up for re-election, it's going to where the what trustee area they're in is going to matter. Um, so if Beal runs in November, she would be running for Banning's seat, not Virginia's. Uh, OK. And do we know if Banning intends to run or not? He He was another appointee. Uh, um, I'm not sure. Yeah, and he was. He he took um, Laura Cap's seat. So yeah. Hey, Josh. Again. I should know this also, but are there term limits for school board members? No. So Wendy Wendy is going to get a third term or seek a third term, uh, presumably. Huh? Yeah, I mean, I think if she doesn't run, Bill Banning is going to run for her seat. Uh, but I think Wendy is not indicated whether she's going to run, but she'll probably run. I mean, why would you not if you like the job and it's not like we have a whole bunch of people challenging you for these seats in district elections. Hey, James, is the current going to do a uh, political endorsement, election endorsement? I hope so. Yes, I hope so. Okay, well, that'll be interesting to watch. All right. The other story you had, Kelly, um, this umpty ump million dollars that the school board uh, miscalculated and failed to pay teachers so now they've sent they sent they sent it off their calculation to the county, our good friend Susan Salcedo, who said you can't do basic arithmetic and what cut the cut the amount in half. Can you sort that all out? 
Yeah. So, okay. I don't, I, I want to give the district a little bit of, of credit here and, and say it wasn't, it wasn't a, it wasn't them doing math wrong technically like they didn't it's not like it's not like they they miscounted and they were like two plus two equals five it wasn't that it was um the form that they filled out is set up um where they have like different expenses and if you don't spend money on a certain thing you're supposed to just leave leave it blank leave like that little box blank uh but the district in those boxes where they didn't spend any money put zeros instead of leaving them blank, which somehow messed up the entire formula, like messed up the entire calculation. Um, I, don't ask me how that works because I don't know anything about budgets or um, filling out CEA so, forms. So the but. bottom line is that they didn't fail to pay teachers six million. They only failed to pay teachers three million that they were due, correct? Yes, yeah, that is, yeah, that is exactly what it was. Um, yeah, it was three point two million. And has that had any effect on the negotiations? I know the district put out a new bulletin about the negotiation. We've we've been watching the situation with the teachers for months, um, hoping we don't get a strike. What's the latest on that? Uh, yeah, so they um, had they released another negotiations update last night. Um, I don't think the the miscalculation doesn't really play into that very much. Um, I think teachers saw that and were just like, well, it doesn't really matter how much they underpaid us. Like the fact is that they, they, they did. Um, and yeah, so last night they had the negotiations. Uh, they released the update. The teachers union reproposed their same proposal from last time, which, which was 15%. Is a big raise of how much? 15% uh, 2024, and then 8% 2025. Um, and the district, and they rejected the district's proposal of, I think it's 9% in 2024 and 4% in the following year. Um, what <laughs> is James happened? raising? Are how you raising you, your hand? How did James... No, honey. Yes, James, you may you may speak. <laughs> you may speak. I, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know the etiquette here, so I. No, I no, we don't have any. We like, don't have no, any. Okay. Okay, because I, <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, and we've just met, Kali. Um, mm -hmm. So apologize, um, but I did want to just jump in there because we actually in the current covered this story, um, uh, and, and about the payment and what was going on, and and you know, there's this issue where there's 55 percent of all. Um, uh, revenues um, have to go by law to teachers, right? Proposition and then what happened, of course, there you go, there you go. Um, and what happened, they received, the district received a boatload of money for COVID. Now that COVID money went to something other than teachers. And that kind of created this lopsided situation um, where you know the teachers um, didn't get paid their 55%. Um, to me, the biggest question is, what the heck are they doing with the other 45%? That's a huge number right there. It's huge, right? So anyway, I'm sorry to jump in, um, but I just wanted to, you know, oh, that's a good throw question. that out there. That's a good question. And, and, and no, I, that's, go ahead, Kelly. Uh, I was going to just say, like, no, that's a good point. Um, and that is the district's excuses. They, they got all of this money for COVID. They had to spend it on COVID things. Um, and they're not the only ones. I covered that in my story too, like Santa Maria Benita, um, some of the other smaller school districts also, you know, technically pay teachers under the minimum, but there's actually an exemption to the 55% rule that says that districts with class sizes smaller than 28 students per class session are exempt from the requirement. They can pay teachers under that minimum. Yeah. All right. Before we leave, there, we should point out the state of California, which managed to go from a $30 million surplus to a $68 million deficit in two years, which is, you know, not easy to do. Uh, the governor's budget does fully fund uh, education. So that uh, that was a little bit of good news. Josh, at City Hall uh, this week, uh, the tenants' rights and uh, evictions and the whole a rental uh, series of issues uh, was up again, and uh, 
they kind of uh, well talk about what they did. They, you know, there was a a, a lot of uh, discussion about how the ordinance was going to look about evictions. What they end up with? Well, this was a fantastic meeting. This was just incredible to watch the politics of it. The the council essentially voted to allow or, or to require that tenants can return to an apartment within two years. So the owners have to give them the first right of refusal. But the whole contention was over whether there would be a maximum rent increase tied to that. So the tenants activists wanted 10% so that you could go back into your apartment, but not have to pay any more than 10% from what you were paying and the property owners the the landlords were like this is outrageous because we need to be able to increase the rent if it's you know a year later two years later and if we're making all these investments then how are we going to pay for that so that was sort of this dispute and of course the tenants and the activists are saying well why are you buying buildings if you're not factoring in the cost of all of this and why are you making your tenants having to pay more and then the other part of it is you you just want to evict them. You this is all a ruse so you can make some changes, but you just want new people to pay a higher rent. So so that's the issue. That's the debate. And so the council ended up uh, agreeing with most of the proposals. There were some harass anti harassment proposals, but they decided we're not going to pay. We're not going to require a cap uh, after a first right of refusal. So and tenants got the, the the right of first refusal, but no cap. Exactly. And it was really amazing to watch Mike Councilman Mike Jordan kind of squirm. And um, I use that term running for re-election this year. Yeah. I mean, and, and I know Mike will probably either pretend like he doesn't care what I think. But it doesn't matter what I think. But this is what other people tell me. OK, squirm because he's running an election year. And Mike went out there for 215 Bath Street on behalf of those tenants who felt as though they were being unfairly evicted. And uh, he advocated for them and he took their side and he made a big dust up about that. And then Thursday or Tuesday, he he like changed his mind a little bit. He said, you know, uh, we don't have enough data. We don't have a study that shows what the impact is on property owners and landlords when you put a cap on a first right to refuse uh, re refusal after two years. And I don't feel like I can make that decision until I have that data. And it's sort of like, whoa, I, I can't believe you're saying this, Mike. And here's what happened. Mike went all out once he heard from the tenant activists and took their side. And then the property owners got to him and said, hey, Mike, you know, this is our side. And so Mike's running an election year. And uh, he kind of watered down his whole message. Megan Harmon, don't, don't, don't insult me because I'm mentioning Megan Harmon. She laid him out, okay? I don't, Kelly saw it. I mean, she looks over him and says, you know, I don't understand what data, what study you are looking for. It doesn't exist because you're looking for some data that's going to allow you to avoid ma making a difficult political decision. And Mike's like this, and Megan's just like, you know, that. And it's just like, holy cow. Because they're, I mean, they're friends. They get along. They're fine. But just like to see that play out in public is, was fascinating. And my last thing, and then I'll shut up here, is Kristen Sneddon. Wow. Yeah. She, she, she gave this incredibly eloquent speech at the beginning. She cited the housing element. One in three Hispanics have had to leave because of rent increases. And she called for, uh, not rent control, she calls it a rent cap. And so she was very strong on this. And, you know, every property owner is just like, no, no, you know, it's like an upside down crucifix or something. It's like, what are you saying? You can't do this. And, uh, but later she kind of backed down just a little bit and said, well, if we can't get the the 10%, let's, let's approve what we can. And so she voted for that. So lots of politics in that room and it's just one of the most fascinating meetings i can recall yeah james you've been on the uh, uh plaintiff side of uh litigation against the city for its various and sundry uh um i i think in 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 your case wasn't that a vacation rental beef but i'm just uh wondering you know sort of philosophically uh 
What do you think about the approach that the city council is taking to the so-called housing crisis, just in terms of the economics of it? Well, thank you uh, for that question, Jerry. Um, the, I, th I mean, I think, look, we look for uh, government as the solution to many problems, right? And I mean, even at UCSB, I think the uh, head of the economics department there um, has been very adamant that uh, the types of controls that uh, cities put on uh, for rent control and the like actually end up boomeranging and, and hurting the very people that they're supposedly trying to help which are those that are, you know, on a low income um, working, working folks. And the reason that happens, of course, is because it limits the supply of housing. And that's a very delicate issue here in Santa Barbara, as you know, because, you know, we want to have a supply increase of rental units. This does not make the supply increase more attractive. Certainly it doesn't. Um, as you mentioned, uh, my wife and I have a vacation rental, one unit vacation rental, um, but, but this does not make it more attractive to make it a long-term rental. We should be making things more attractive for long-term rentals. Um, and then of course, balancing that is the desire that people don't want to live in Honolulu here with, uh, you know, 40 high um, buildings. And so I think it's a real debate, but I, I think it's gone a little bit too far to the limitations and the, and kind of the blaming the landlord in this case. Yeah. Well, and you, you know, the, they sort of snuck that through uh, Nick's piece uh, uh, this week about the uh, uh, proposed housing uh, project that Macy's uh, city has just punted on the um, on the on its height limit. Uh, so that's uh, we're hoping Nick can join us. He's out at uh, and covering an event where elected officials are once again celebrating the end of homelessness. Uh, we'll see what happens uh, with that. Uh, Callie, you had an interesting piece about new state laws uh, in 2024 that are going to affect particularly the environment. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, you know, come 2024 in the new year, uh, a lot of state laws have been enacted or going into effect now that were enacted last year. Um, and a few of those have to do with the environment. Uh, I think some of the more interesting ones are uh, the ban on gas powered lawn tools. Um, so no new gas, it's a, a ban on the sale of all new gas powered lawn tools. So it's a ban uh, on so, sale, but yes. not, yeah, okay. So if you, if you already have one, you don't need to chuck it. Like it's just you don't have to turn it in. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you can keep your old lawnmower. You just can't buy a new one. Um, but the state is offering like rebates and grants for landscapers to buy uh, EV models of la uh, lawnmowers and leaf blowers and all of that. And I think the most interesting thing about that was like how how many emissions or like how high the emissions are from these things. Like the California Air Resources Board says that the emissions from a lawnmower, using a lawnmower for one hour is equivalent to driving a car 300 miles, which is crazy to me. I had never thought about it like that, but um, yeah. So that's one of them. There are a bunch of other ones um, like limiting, um, the like handoff of, or I guess imposing restrictions on the handoff of orphan, low producing or idle oil wells in the state. So if a, if a company buys an idle or low producing oil well, they'll have to put money into a bond that says that they will pay for the entire cost of cleaning it up, decommissioning it, plugging it and abandoning it. Whereas previously, they wouldn't have to. They would put like a little bit of money towards it, but it was like not even, a, it was a very, very small fraction of the total cost. And then the state has to pick up the cost of abandoning those wells. I don't know if I explained that really well, but yeah. yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. All right. Interesting stuff. Um, Josh, uh, uh, James um, talked about how part of the reason for, um, 
Santa Barbara Current was uh, these a lot of these folks are writing in the uh, morning paper, um, which is no more. But uh, interesting development in that bankruptcy this week. Uh, can mm. you talk about that? Yeah, so it, it looks as though the bankruptcy trustee is trying to go after the transfer of these buildings. Uh, they have filed a, uh, a complaint in bankruptcy court that says these, the news press building, the Kellogg plant in Goleta, that it was allegedly transferred with the intent of sort of uh, avoiding paying liabilities and uh, debts. And so they're going to court to try to prove that this was a methodical process to transfer these into an LLC that is owned by the same person who owned the news press. And so that's what is a big deal. And so if that happens, I guess, theoretically, the the court can seize the assets and then liquidate. They're worth them. collectively, what, maybe 10, 12 million, something like that? Um, probably more than that, I think. I, I thought I saw somewhere the building was like 15 million, and I don't know how much. The, the they so 20, 20, yeah. yeah. And so liquidate and then pay off all the uh, people who are owed money. And so that would be a like a, a really, it would be a great for the people who are owed money, but a catastrophic end for this institution just because somebody allegedly, you know, didn't want to pay earlier. You end up paying much worse down the road and so uh so that's what's happening um is that and there's going to be a court hearing as to whether they can prove that these transfers were done with that intent to avoid i think the court hearing called it or that the document alleged that it was a sham they use the word fraud and so this is a significant deal but as you know jerry i think you told me this is a uh, bankruptcy court is very complicated it's yeah. not so who knows what kind of machinations are going to come I mean, out of I've this. talked to top lawyers who are like, "Nah, eh, don't even ask me about that because it's so it's so uh, specific to to bankruptcy." Um, and then the there's a 24 page uh, complaint there that, that the uh, lawyers for the bankruptcy trustee filed. And one of the things that I thought was interesting in there is they haven't been able to get access to the building. Uh, they she they oh, can't yeah. get the keys, which. Boy, is that uh, that's on brand. All right. Uh, let's talk a little politics. Um, Doss Williams failed to get the endorsement of the Women's Political Committee, the only Democratic incumbent who did. Um, how big a deal is that, do you think, uh, for uh, for Roy Lee? Who's uh, you know the long shot opponent of Doss? Is of what does it mean? Do you have thoughts on that, Josh? Uh, well, as a practical matter, Jerry, it probably doesn't mean much in terms of Doss getting reelected, but it's really intriguing because Doss Williams got the endorsement of the Women's Political Committee over Laura Caps. Okay, and Laura is no lightweight. She's a Four very years ago, yeah, yeah. She's a substantial, significant, smart, qualified, all that stuff. So for them back then to give it to, you know, a women's organization that is supposed to be promoting women in politics to give it to a man over Laura. And then now they're not going to give it to Doss. I mean, I think that is really starting to speak, uh, you know, the, the quiet part out loud. Uh, people are feeling a little bit more comfortable institutions and people saying, you know, we don't like this guy as much as we used to. And um, this is a manifestation of that. Uh, in the press release, it just kind of says that we do not make an endorsement in this district. So um, at some point, I'm sure, you know, uh, it'll come out. We'll ask, you know, them what the reasons were for that. Uh, but I probably has something to do with what happened in Montecito, which I didn't cover because I don't really cover the Board of Supervisors. Yeah. You'll be shocked to learn I've been making calls about this. And uh, yeah, what do you think? Well, uh, you remember, the, I think it was the Montecito Planning Commission, a woman named Susan Keller, who's, uh, you know, just a, a good citizen who spends a lot of time volunteering and has been on that uh, board uh, for a while, appointed by DAS. You know, he sort of rudely and suddenly kicked her off, fired her from it to, because two men... Uh, who are on the uh, on the board were unhappy that she was asking too many questions, um, 
and Paula Lopez, a uh, former KEYT star anchor who is now the president of the WPC, went down to the county and, and gave a very passionate um, address supporting Susan Keller and basically calling Das out for it. Yeah, so I think, the, you know, that's kind of one example. I know a lot of people were trying to get Paula to run against Das. So, uh, you know, to the extent that the endorsement came from a 15-member board of directors, which Paula heads, all of them, you know, swore omerta. They're not talking about it, but uh, I think we can see how things have changed uh, uh, since uh, four years ago. Uh, James, you going to endorse Roy Lee in the uh, supervisor's race? Uh, well, I tell you, I've met him. I met Roy. I really like him. He's a you know young guy, family guy. He's got some kids. He has a small business, a great little restaurant. Um, you know, in fact, I I listened to him. I, I thought, my God, he sounds conservative. <laughs> you just he's a registered. Chance. He's registered D. Yeah, he's, he's pretty. Well, I don't know. Yeah, uh, but you know what? Actually, I have a question about that because it seems you know with with Dot, he's. Uh, very influential. I think his assistant at the county also um, uh, is in charge of the Democrat Party here. Um, yeah, she's a and uh, I mean he's a he's a you know he's a he's very powerful here politically. And and um, do you think that's turning uh, because of what um, what happened with those nets in Montecito and uh, some of the some of the pushback of fi finally for the for the marijuana um, issues that have. He's been he's been championing. Do you think there's a turn in that? Yes, and yes. I mean, there were a lot of angry people about the Nets, people with a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether that represents votes, I don't I don't know. And and I you know the cannabis thing is just handled so badly, as the grand jury has said, and and so divisive. And so I think there's just a lot of lingering upset about that, and the way that he's just kind of you know dismissed people who disagree with him. And and as you point out, his chief of staff, yes, is the chair of the local Democratic Party and his administrative assistant is now running his campaign, a former uh, operative of the Democratic Party. So a lot of patronage uh, going on over there. All right, we got to quit it. Uh, uh, Do, uh, Josh, who you got on the podcast? Well, Jerry, you and I are doing some podcasts. We're speaking with uh, Joan Hartman, Supervisor Joan Hartman. Yeah, I forgot. Later today. <laughs> yeah, and then we got another one uh, planned for the the next week. I just last thing I just want to follow up. Um, you know, is is the whole the whole Doss Williams thinks he's incredibly powerful. He's going to get reelected. Roy Lee really does not have a form any kind of a chance of beating him because he just you need to raise money, 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 and it matters. But to answer James's question is that Roy said it on his pod on the podcast that we did. He said that to your face, Doss Williams tells you what you want to hear, but then privately does things differently. And Roy Lee said that. And I can tell you that I have heard that from so many people who say we're tired of it and they don't necessarily have the courage to come out forward and say it publicly and scream it because they're afraid of this incredible power imbalance that exists politically with Doss Williams being who he is and the party and having that control over anyone who might have a differing viewpoint. And it's really insidious because you have people who are strong people who feel as though I can't say anything publicly, Josh, because my political career will be over. And I think that's the stuff that incrementally people like Paula Lopez and other people on the board are starting to feel a little more comfortable kind of getting out there. And so that's not me saying that I don't like DOS or that DOS is a horrible person. That's just what is real. That's just what people say all the time. They just don't say it out loud because they're afraid of retribution and, um, you know, we're journalists, as James said, just to tie it all up, if we can't challenge government and electeds and politicians and put it out there, then, you know, what are, what are we doing? You know, we don't want to get so cozy where we're just like, you know, part of the problem. So Yeah, and we should point out Roy was on with us 
uh, and uh, had some strong uh, rhetoric against Das. Das is uh, going to come on the show uh, later in the month. So uh, Josh and I will be uh, interviewing him. So feel free to send in any questions to newsmakerswithjr at gmail.com. Callie, what are you working on? You had another cover story about the, the reefs. That was, uh, you worked on that one for a long time. What was that about? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that one um, took me a while. That was about uh, this uh, local nonprofit called the Fish Reef Project. They're trying to make artificial reefs in the Goleta Bay, um, as well as some other places around the world. And they just deployed an artificial reef in Baja. And basically it's, you know, a mix of decreasing uh, like carbon in the ocean, as well as uh, increasing fish habitat and fish populations for fishermen outside of MPAs or marine yeah. protected areas. Yeah, Callie's been doing a lot of good enterprise environmental stories, so go check out, check that out at, at the paper. James, what, anything uh, to look for uh, coming up in the current that we should know about? Uh, I absolutely. Today, actually, we're going to uh, publish an article by uh, Dr. Paul Igen. Uh, he's a pretty uh, popular doctor that's been practicing here for decades uh, to talk about uh, some of the some of the troubling truths behind uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, which, as you may recall, kind of hit us about four years ago this month. Yeah. Yeah. OK. All right. Well, James uh, Fechner, Josh Molina, Kelly Fozzi, thank you all uh, so much. Uh, and uh, thank you for watching. We'll see you next time on Newsmakers TV.